Grundsätzlich muss man sagen, it's generally true to say that the avalanche danger away from secured peace is what presents the greatest risk to winter athletes. And when it comes to avalanche danger, there are different types of avalanches to expect. And the first way we differentiate between avalanches is by their release mechanisms. The avalanche danger naturally depends on the weather, or the weather conditions, and the terrain, or the terrain features, slope aspect, etc. In the Alps, we are lucky to have detailed avalanche bulletins for most regions. These provide information on the dangers in the relevant terrain. Naturally, you must still always get your own idea of the danger situation, so of the probability of avalanche release when you reach the mountains. Generally, you can split avalanches into three categories regarding their release mechanisms. The first is the slab avalanche, the most dangerous avalanche for winter athletes. The second is the loose snow avalanche, and the third is the gliding avalanche. The first type of avalanche that we will talk about is the loose snow avalanche. Loose snow avalanches have this point-shaped fracture and this pear-shaped fall path. This means that something starts to slide from a point, and following the snowball principle more and more, snow slides along with it, so that we end up with this pear-shaped deposit zone. Loose snow avalanches are often caused by something falling into the snow. Steep rocky terrain somehow drops a snowball, a clump of snow into it. Then we have this point-shaped slide and it slowly gets wider and wider. These avalanches aren't particularly fast. Of course, if the path becomes steeper further on, even these avalanches will accelerate. But due to their small propagation, so their dimensions, they rarely lead to a burial because they simply do not carry enough snow. What you need to know about loose snow avalanches is that they can be very dry, but also wet. This means if there is a new snow problem and the snow is very unbonded, it can lead to loose snow avalanches with this point-shaped fracture and this tongue-shaped propagation. And it is very fluffy, very light, and not so dramatically dangerous. In contrast, loose snow avalanches can also be made up of wet snow, which is very heavy. Of course, very wet snow is very heavy. And while it might not be particularly fast, if you are caught in it, it cements you in, and that is very dangerous. Yes, a gliding avalanche differs from a slab avalanche in that it involves a gliding process rather than a crack mechanism in a weak layer. With a gliding avalanche, the entire mass of snow glides down steep, flat surfaces. Typically, these are meadow slopes, but they could also be smooth slabs of rock. Gliding avalanches usually occur in early winter, when the ground is still warm and not frozen. The wetter the ground, the more likely it is that the entire thing can glide down because friction is minimized. A typical characteristic of a gliding avalanche is a fish mouth. This means that the snowpack rips open and you can see movement in the terrain. Never stand under cracks like these because a gliding avalanche can trigger at any time. The third type of avalanche we will talk about is the snow slab. 99% of winter sports accidents in the Alps are actually caused by slab avalanches. The interesting thing is that in 90% of cases, the first person to set foot on a slope is the one to trigger the avalanche. For a slab avalanche, we need a slope steepness of 30 degrees. They can be remotely triggered. That means you're standing on flat ground, but then affect the steep area of the slope, triggering the snow slab. They can also release spontaneously, especially when they are subject to an additional load. So if it rains or snows on the slope and the load increases, it can cause spontaneous avalanche release. But other weather conditions can also cause this to happen. A typical distinguishing feature of slab avalanches is this line-like fracture. The skier triggers the slab, it breaks off and begins to accelerate. The whole slab then breaks up into flows that accelerate downhill. These skier-triggered avalanches are usually around 50 centimeters thick on average. This is how thick they need to be to get triggered. And these slabs that are triggered by skiers are on average 50 to 70 meters wide. 
The flow path length is around 150 meters on average, and the slope steepness begins at 30 degrees. So we can observe slab avalanches on slopes of 30 degrees and steeper, and they occur most frequently at a slope steepness of 38 degrees. Because skiers often trigger the snow slab themselves, they are also right in the middle of them. So they are often somewhere in this gliding snow slab and therefore rarely have a chance to somehow ski out sideways. For a snow slab to form, we need four ingredients. The first thing we need is unfavorable layering. This means we need the slab itself, the slab of snow that slides down, which in turn needs to be on top of a soft, weak layer. Otherwise, the ingredient that will get the slab moving is missing. The second thing we need is a skier, or the stress element, the initiation as it is referred to, so someone who triggers the slab. The third thing we need is the ability of the slab to propagate the crack in the weak layer. This way the slab gets really big and can release in one go. This ability to propagate is a particularly characteristic indication or criterion for these snow slabs that is difficult to assess. And the last ingredient we need, the fourth one, is sufficient slope steepness. As we've already heard, the snow will only start gliding on slopes 30 degrees or steeper, and the average steepness for skier-triggered slab avalanches is 38 degrees. Accurately observing avalanches and also classifying the avalanches we see allows us to practice very, very good risk management in the mountains. Nothing is a better indicator of avalanche danger than fresh avalanches. And if I see which avalanches have come down where, I can use them as orientation for my tour plans and avoid these dangerous areas. This means keep your eyes open, recognize avalanches, classify them, and correctly identify the process. And if you manage that, then you'll essentially always be safe out on the mountain.